Wonderful. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, and thank you all for being here today. I have the, the great pleasure of going first in our trio of speakers, which I always quite like because I get to offer a little bit of a grounding and a little bit of a background in what you're going to hear in this next hour and what you're already sort of seeing throughout the day as well. So my name's David. I'm here from the Royal Mint Museum. Uh, the Royal Mint, of course, has quite a lengthy history, but the museum has a history of around 200 years. We were founded in 1816. We are uh, collectors supreme. I'm sure you can all appreciate um, the enjoyment of coin collecting. Well, we collect not only coins in the museum, but also every aspect of the coin production process here at the Royal Mint. We collect items that tell the entire story of producing a coin. So the coin themselves, and then one step back, the blanks and the sometimes trial or experimental pieces as well. We collect the tools that are used to strike the coins and indeed the the earlier parts of the tools that are used to make the dies. We collect plaster models as well for three-dimensional representations of the design and all the way back to the artwork, both the artwork that is successful in coin design competitions and that which doesn't end up being moved forward as well. So there's some examples on the screen here today. I hope you can see the light is on it a little bit, but I hope you can make out some of the wonderful items in our collection. What I wanted to talk to you today about is that early stage of the process, that art and design right at the start of how something becomes a coin from an idea. And a part of that involves the Royal Mint Advisory Committee. The committee was founded in 1922. And the idea being that it would act as an independent arbiter of public taste, essentially. The decision was taken away from the senior, the deputy master at the Royal Mint and those senior figures, the responsibility was taken away to have to determine what public taste might be, what people might want on their coinage. It was thought that that might be better handled by experts, by artists, by art historians, numismatists as well. And so the Royal Mint Advisory Committee was then founded with experts from, as you might be able to make out in some of the text here, places like the Department of Coins and Medals at the British Museum, representatives from the, the V&A, representatives, or a personal representative of the King as well, who of course gets quite a significant say in the design. From the early 1950s as well, of course, the late Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, headed up the committee as president. This was a fantastic boon for the Royal Mint Advisory Committee. Having somebody there who had such a personal and informal link with the monarch to comment upon designs was incredibly useful. So part of our collection obviously is a great deal of coronation related material and material related to the start of the late Queen Elizabeth II's reign. And so what I'll do now is I'll take you through a little bit in our collection that relates to that and relates to some of the coin design as well. What you can see here are some designs that are taken from the minutes of the Royal Mint Advisory Committee. Designs that were under consideration, both for the coinage reverses of Queen Elizabeth and for the 1953 coronation crown. Part of what we do at the Royal Mint Museum is archiving materials like this, the, uh, the minutes of the Royal Mint Advisory Committee, both historically and present day as well. I'm quite privileged in that I not only get to look back several hundred years in my job, but I also get to look a few years forward as we fulfill those sort of administrative functions of the committee. So a little bit of a sneak peek into what's coming as well. What often eludes me is what's happening right now. You can see here some of the designs, and it's tough to make out on the screen, but also when you see them up close in person as well, um, precisely the differences between some of the designs that you see here, because that's the role of the Royal Mint Advisory Committee, really. It's looking into those minute differences, not just what should be on a coin A or B, but whether a particular line and an expression changes how a face looks, whether a slight degree of rotation changes the feel of the design on the coin, changes the impression that you get of the coin. And you can see some of the text in the paragraph here, taken from those minutes, talks about how the committee deliberated whether bits of designs could be combined as well, whether perhaps we could have the, um, the orientation of the horse in Mr. Ledwood's submission number eight, and if we could perhaps have the orientation of the monarch in number nine, and could something be merged together from that? Because that is how that design process comes together, has done historically, and still to an extent does today, but I will leave the, the modern stuff to my, my uh, subsequent speakers. 
The portrait as well, the Mary Gillick portrait, which became the first definitive coinage portrait of Queen Elizabeth II, went through that same process at the committee. And we have in the collection a great wealth of material, of designs, of sketches, of plaster models, as minute changes were made throughout the design. When it came down to it, the competition really was between Mary Gillick and Cecil Thomas, who had quite a, a considerable advantage over Mrs. Gillick in terms of a back catalogue of coin design. And there was quite a lot of back and forth in the minutes of the Royal Mint Advisory Committee, and quite a lot of back and forth in which both artists were invited to submit and resubmit sculptures and designs so that the design could be worked up into something that was just right. What you see here on the screen is one of the plaster models which features a penciled in inscription around the edge, part of that process where we have some of the design finished up and some of the design, the inscription being added on at a later date, being modified, being tweaked. It was, as you can see at the very bottom, ultimately the opinion of the committee that the final model should be, uh, well, the nose should be treated more delicately, but also that the effigy should generally be strengthened. This turned out to be one of, the, uh, one of the strengths and one of the reasons we really remember the Gillick portrait of Queen Elizabeth for its delicate nature, its soft nature. It was distinct following several monarchs previous that had had quite large looming portraits that filled the field of the coin. But it's not only the Royal Mint Advisory Committee that have opinions on coins, of course, and this is really the purpose of the committee, to act, as I said, as the arbiters of public taste. What you see here, you might be able to make out the handwriting, are some letters from the National Archive submitted in the 1950s to the Mint. People asking questions of the Mint and making requests of the coinage. There's one letter where somebody's requesting, what is it, two sparrows on the farthing, which is, I think, quite ambitious on a little coin like that. Somebody is requesting, I don't know how people feel about this, the return of the Gothic crown into circulation. And someone requesting that we make the two shilling pieces hexagonal to avoid confusion with half crowns. Reasonable suggestions, but this is then the purpose of the committee to act upon some suggestions, sensible suggestions, and to make decisions that will ultimately reflect the needs of the general public and their coinage. I'll take you a little bit further back now, back to 1936 and the story of Edward VIII, which I won't dwell on too much because it's probably quite a familiar story to many collectors and many coin enthusiasts in the room, but safe to say Edward VIII was a bit of an awkward customer for the Royal Mint. Uh, as you're all now doubtless aware, the monarch in portraits on coinage faces in the opposite direction to that of their predecessor conventionally. It's a tradition that goes back about 300 years. And it's a tradition that Edward VIII was uh, not particularly happy with because he would much prefer, he did much prefer, to face left instead of right, the same way as his predecessor. Facing left would show off his good side, the parting in his hair. And what you can see here is sketches, photographs, and one of the proof pieces in gold of Edward VIII that was struck as a trial and experimental piece to show, again, that kind of progression of design and how things change. You can, you can see, perhaps on the sketch, that there are adjustments being made to the chin, to the hairline, to the back of the head, just to make sure that the shape is kept exactly as it should be. But the reverses, too, for the proposed coinage of Edward VIII are incredibly interesting. Now, of course, there never was a circulating coinage of Edward VIII in this country. His reign lasted less than a year, from January 1936 through until December. But there was plenty of discussion as to whether or not there should be a change in reverses, a full change of reverses of all of the coins. And, of course, a great number of designs were proposed and went through the Royal Mint Advisory Committee. Artists designed sets of coins, artists submitted these designs, there was uh, an invitation to a number of prominent artists to submit designs. And I've shown some of them on the slide here, focusing on the crowns and the half crowns, so you can make out a little bit of the detail. Harold Wilson Parker, I quite like these designs, they, he submitted a set of designs that encompassed the values and the embodiment of the crown. So the idea was the crown piece here, would demonstrate a sort of a giving tribute and making offering to the crown. The half crown here represented peace, through the dove of peace, through the olive branches, and then it goes on down the denominations with different representations of ideals of the crown. 
George Cougar Gray, some of those at the bottom, submitted a much more traditional set of designs, heraldic. Uh, a variation on the sort of heraldry that has been seen on the coins for a very long time. Much more traditional, uh, actually ended up being favoured by the Royal Mint Advisory Committee at that time. Perhaps a little bit of a backlash to the 1935 Jubilee crown, that rocking horse, really avant-garde design. Perhaps a bit of a backlash to that, moving back to the traditional. I'd have included on the right as well a design from Edmund Dulac, which I really like because it is a frighteningly literal interpretation of a seahorse. Half horse, half fish or aquatic creature of some kind. But you can see the sort of interesting designs that were considered of all different types for the proposed reverses of Edward VIII. So all of these sorts of designs and more form part of the Royal Mint Museum collection. A part of what we do is recording and telling the story of everything we've done here for hundreds of years. And will continue to do thereafter. Our original remit when being set up was to record a series of designs, record coins, record everything we do so that artists and engravers can draw from the past and bring that into the future. And on that spirit, I thought I'd finish with something a little bit more uh, well-known, a little bit more recent, which is the Kew Gardens 50p. <clears throat> there are a great many designs that went through the Royal Mint Advisory Committee for this coin. But you can see here, even on the design that really ended up being worked into the finished product, how much detail goes into changing very small things about the coin and refining the design as it goes along. The model on the left here, of course, is quite busy. There's a lot more um, foliage, there's a lot more leaves in the background. And then even as you progress towards something that is a little bit cleaner and that looks more like the final design, you can perhaps see at the bottom the change in lettering from that design through to the finished piece. The purpose then of the advisory committee is to make those very small, subtle changes to ensure that what we get on the coins is as aesthetically pleasing as possible, is as representative as it can be of British identity and culture and values. As I've said, this is but a small part of what we hold in the collection in terms of art and design. We have well, over 100,000 coins, over 40,000 pieces of tooling and plaster models that detail everything back as far as we possibly can in terms of coin design. But I hope I've been able to give you a brief overview of how the Royal Mint Advisory Committee considers designs and how we go about archiving and maintaining that process here at the museum. I'm going to hand you over to Thomas Doherty now, who is a coin designer who can tell you, uh, sorry, a sculptor who can tell you far more about present day designs than I ever could. And Thank you very much for your time and attention.